Hello. Uh, today we have very special guests talking about how to make money with Windows Azure apps. Uh, Ronnie Hansen, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm uh, Ronnie Hansen. I'm, I'm a business development manager in, in Windows Azure incubation team in Western Europe. And I work with uh, customers and partners in Norway and Finland. So I will be over here every so often in Finland. And, and in this presentation I'm going to do uh, a talk about how to evaluate if you are going to adopt software as a service. Uh, if you're moving to software as a service, what can possibly change? And this is business related, not technical. And then we're going to move into, into the Windows Azure platform essentials, doing a high level presentation of, of the most important stuff in Windows Azure that you as a ISV need to evaluate before. And when you go for software as a service, probably many already have done this. You are running your application from on-premise and delivering it uh, to, to uh, customers. Uh, but the traditional way is that most customers or most ISVs deliver uh, application on-premise to their customers and, and run it on-premise. Um, you could also run it in an infrastructure as a service solution. This is kind of comparable to the, the virtual machines in your, in your, uh, in your servers or in your, in your local data center. Uh, but this is like uh, uh, having it running in, in, in a large hosting company like Microsoft. And we also have the platform as a service where Microsoft or the, the vendor manage all, all the levels of from networking to runtime and you run your application on top of that. And, and you as an ISV, you probably want to do a, a software as a service offering and, and the customer of you, you, your customer will see your solution as a software and they don't have to run anything on premise. So when you're an ISV delivering software as a service, you could choose to, to run your software as a service on premise, meaning in your own data center, uh, in an infrastructure as a service that could be uh, in Azure or, or in a local hoster or a, in a platform as a service from those vendors that support it. And, and in my opinion, Windows Azure is, will be, is the best offer for the best uh, functionality for platform as a service for your application. So why would you decide to adopt software as a service? There are probably two important drivers to do that. that the first one is that you might be able to grow your business with software as a service. Um, and going after smaller firms or going after new markets. And like in large countries like Norway and Finland, it's, it's, it's also difficult to physically go to your customers uh, without having a large sales force. So by having it online, you, you will also uh, reduce um, travel costs and, and also have the uh, unnecessary need of uh, driving around for doing upgrades. But you you also have the probability of other companies doing software as a service uh, and you don't want to be left behind in that market. An example of that is that uh, when Google started building uh, um, online mail um, to threaten Microsoft's business, Microsoft has to had to respond by um, building their own software as a service and enabled uh, Microsoft uh, ex exchange online. So, when you are assessing if you, uh, if you need or want to go for software as a service, you need to look, look at it from two perspectives. The benefits and the risks for your customer, and the benefits and risks for your company. So, for, for a customer, you start with the customers. The benefits with software as a service is that you have faster deployments, there's no local installation and, and people can just, often they can start doing a demo just by uh, enabling an account directly online. It's a user space pricing uh, which let you customers pay for only what they use. Uh, typically you will, they will pay per person per, per month and, and when that changes up or down it's, it's, it changes the pricing. It's also a less financial risk for the customers, 
because they have, don't have to pay upfront uh, licenses or, or uh, buy hardware and, and deploy that on-premise. On and it also reduces the need for on-premise resources, that's including services and IT personnel. And the upgrades are easier. There will be no on-premise software to upgrade, and everybody will have the, the same version because they're sharing the, the, the online version. And it can also have a better performance uh, because it, it scales better on the server side um, depending on how your internal IT is, is budgeted. But there are also risks. And for the customer, he, he needs to trust uh, an external provider for running their applications. And that's all, also for availability and if it's online and it's running or security. You might have company policies or there might even be laws in your current country that's, uh, that's prohibiting you from doing that. Which, uh, yeah, you can raise legal and regulatory concerns. Uh, and it can also limit customization uh, because you share the multi-tenant solution and, and if you have it on-premise, it's easier to do customization of your apps, even with third-party uh, uh, consultants. And it can also be hard to integrate on, uh, with existing on-premise applications. And it can also have a lower performance if, if the latency from your, from your company to the, to the provider is, is bad, you will feel that. And uh, if your internet link is, is slow, you might need to upgrade that. Uh, but there are also benefits and risks for, for you as an ISV in this, uh, which you need to evaluate. The benefits is that you, you have potential to reach new customers in broader and even global markets. And this means probably you have to do some uh, localization of the language and also of business logic. Um, and you can sell directly, directly to business decision makers. You don't have to go to, through IT to get them to buy servers. The business decision makers can just buy it because they see the features uh, are what they need. And it can pro provide a more predictable revenue than traditional li licensing because you have a, a monthly uh, rate and that doesn't change that, uh, that rapid if, if your market if there is a, a dec decline in the market, typically uh, traditional lic licensing and sales will, you will see that in your sales revenue, but in, in, a, in a software as a service, you will mostly continue what you already have. Maybe you'll lose new ones, but the, the re recurring revenue will continue. Uh, and you can have lower support costs due to the shared multi-tenant uh, applications. And even more important about usage is that you can add monitoring logic to, to your code and you can instantly see uh, what people are doing and how they are using the application. So you could feed that back to support and development and, and improve your applications. There are also risks. And the risk is that you have to demonstrate real value upfront. Um, Traditionally, you have to do a demo of your application. Salesforce are going out and doing a demo, and, and the customer will purchase based on, on the perceived value of a product. But here, you have to actually show value before the customer can, can actually buy it. Uh, and revenue it builds more slowly because the pricing model, you typically don't have an upfront license, um, but you have to monthly recurring revenue. And it may lessen your ability to sell customization. So if your company is heavily dependent on, on having consultants doing uh, changes to the applications to, to consulting, it will uh, affect your income. And it can also bring new sales challenges because the customer uh, can resist the cloud. Typical we see is that customer face uh, fear of security, they fear that the cloud is not secure enough. Um, technically, I would 
disagree with that, but the, men the mental choice for the it's a mental thing. I, th I feel you have to persuade the, and explain the security models of of the cloud uh, operating systems. And my personal belief is that uh, it's it's certainly more safe to run run a software as a service application than in in a safe environment like Windows Azure than in in hosting it in a third party hosting company or even running it on on premise. Um, both of the last scenarios, I, I believe the security personnel uh, and the procedures are, are less than um, what uh, global actors like Microsoft is able to do. And it also requires uh, changes in your sales process with pricing and, and incentives for your sales force. So this is a decision tree that can be used when you're deciding for, for going so far as a service or not. And we have the green one on the left and the red one on the right. And, and we could call the, the green one for, for, uh, for greed and the red one for, for fear. So uh, if you want to grow your business, is it possible to boost your profits by building a software as a service solution? And if you can answer yes on that one, it's, it's go ahead and create a software as a service version. And if you can enter a new market uh, by creating a software as a service application, you should do that by creating a new application. And on the right side, if you, if you have a, another company delivering a software as a service company, software as a service product, uh, that's uh, an alternative to your application. You should go ahead and, and create a, a version of your application defending your, your place. Probably you, shouldn't, you should evaluate if you need to deliver all your features that you have in your on-premise version in, in this new application. Uh, you could probably start with, with having enough features to match the, the competitor's application. And the other option is, even if there is no co another company doing that, you have to evaluate if there could be some companies that could hurt you with, with this. If, if there is a yes on that one, you should at least plan for a, how to build a version of a software as a service version. And in the bottom, you see that the, if you can answer no to all of this, you, you, you end up with ignore software as a service. My personal opinion is that you there's very few traditional software companies that is uh, allowed to do that. You, at least you have to do a real uh, evaluation of that. You just can't ignore software as a service and say, that's nothing for me. You, you do have to do your homework here. Just a sidestep here away from software as a service solution. It's in the cloud. And Windows Azure is not only for software as a service solutions. You can perfectly well host uh, single tenant solutions like, like your applications probably are today. It's a single tenant application. You deploy it at each customer site, the same version at, or, or even different versions at different customers. In, in using cloud versions, you could actually deploy your applications to uh, per customer. That gives you still the options to have a, a modifications to your code per customer, but it, this doesn't give you the benefits of, of running a, a shared tenor solution. So this is something you need to evaluate really carefully if you, if you want to go single tenant. But running development or testing is another example of, of using uh, cloud solutions, um, which can be spun up for, for low testing or, or development. And by enabling um, Microsoft enables uh, infrastructure as a service in Azure this summer in preview mode still, um, but it enables you to transition to platform as a service over time and a software as a service over in the end. And typically, if you have, a, if you have an old-fashioned fat client application, you could at least uh, run your backend in the cloud and, and add more reporting and analytics for, uh, and web input uh, as an add-on feature to your existing uh, software. So moving to SaaS, what can change? There are 
a lot of things that business-wise change when you do software as a service compared to traditional on-premise delivery. Uh, target customers. You might reach your current target markets more efficiently. So it's, it's, you're going to get more customers quicker. Uh, the benefits of SaaS uh, are appealing to many, uh, many customers. Uh, a SaaS application might also re let you reach new targets, uh, global or, or, or other organizations that are too expensive to sell to through normal channels. You could even have a, a, a version of the SaaS solution that has less functionality than your on-premise solution uh, to another price than the on-premise solution. And you can also build a new, completely new software as a service solution that's different from your uh, existing uh, on-premise solution to, to have new features and other features. What we see is that business models are changing. It's, uh, it's a change from the uh, traditional licensing model to subscription-based modeling. And we have to take that uh, as a fact and, and evaluate how this is going to impact our uh, industry. Pricing. We have actually three choices to have to base our pricing on your our product. And the most normal one is, is uh, such a use per user per month or per device per year. Some even have a setup fee on that. Or per unit, you have to define your unit yourself. It, it could be per transaction, per, per gigabyte of storage, or per connection, or whatever is, is suitable for your application. And you have the free version and freemium, where you charge only for premium complementary features or add ads to your, to your applications to do that. These are three different uh, pricing options and they can be mixed and matched in all the way you choose. Uh, but you have to g evaluate this carefully to find which one is, is the best for your business. So, when you run a software as a service solution, you will have the monthly recurring revenue as an important thing. And in this uh, uh, graph, you can see that in the beginning, you have, you have a relatively long uh, development time and cost. Uh, before you, it's, it's a, going to be a longer time before you break even with, with software as a service compared to traditional uh, on-premise solutions. Uh, mostly because you, you don't have a large licensing upfront from the customers. You have a monthly recurring revenue. And, uh, but the positive thing about this is that it's, it's a longer, it's a bigger chance for, for a, a better revenue over the time. The sales process change. Uh, with an on-premise application, you have sales reps doing uh, uh, demos and, and showing the applications to customers. And uh, the buying decision is, is based on perceived value. And the customer is actually seeing the products <laughs> after they purchase it. And <laughs> it might even not get used uh, because it doesn't fit their, their need. On a SaaS application, you have actually have to try, customers try the application before buy them, they buy them and it's based on the, on the real value of the product. And it's really important that when you do this, um, you have to somehow help the customers so they see the real value really quick. Because it's, it's a complex application and you, they, they need training to actually see the real value and there's no people to demo the features. You can run into a problem uh, that the customers doesn't see the value and, and select to not use this application. So user friendliness is, is key here, I think, to, to yeah. the application. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, which is also important because uh, getting the user happy over time is also important for, for user friendliness. Yes. So it's a, it's, it's a win-win scenario having doing, doing this. So for sales process, you have lots of options. I have one example here. You can, uh, you can, you can still continue doing direct sales uh, no, you can do direct sales, but you can also continue doing other channels like distributors or, or resellers. Um, but since uh, the, the model is changing, uh, there's less money up front and there's less 
the, uh, there's less money to give to the resellers or distributors because there's less money up front. Uh, they might not want to do a sales of your product. You need to find other models to compensate, the, compensate them. Uh, maybe you have to do um, uh, an, um, a part of the monthly recurring revenue the first year. For example, you, you get 50% of each dollar for, for every first year and 20% and the next year for, for the resellers. Um, instead of having a, a part of the li original license. Um, we also have the customer-led sales process. The customers will find your software as a service application on the internet. If they, they want a software as a service application, they are already on the internet, so they are searching for your app. So, so they will learn through your, about your apps through your website, and it's really, really important that you spend time and money on building a website that's, that's attractive. You, you might need to add a live chat agent uh, to actually help people onboarding. Um, and you should have an option to, to let the people try the app for free. And, and the customers then are able to subscribe for the app themselves. You, you, you probably want to do some, some uh, on, uh, activations through credit cards to, instead of invoicing <laughs> to get this sales process quicker. So when marketing your software as a service solution, you, you, that means web marketing because people are on the web searching for it. You could, of course, do traditional marketing, but uh, the, doing a search engine marketing, meaning uh, Google Ads or Bing Ads, uh, you have to do search engine optimization so people can find your app. And if people find your applications online, they probably want online support. But it's also important to remember that traditional telephone support is, is very important. People really want to have someone to call when, th when they're stuck. And if your website is down, they, they want to have people to call and ask what's happening. <laughs> That's the basic thing to have, <laughs> yeah. actually, yeah. yeah. You also have to have a subscription management in place. It, it, it people get changed your billing, how you do billing today. So you should have a, a, a management system uh, to manage renewals of, of, uh, of the licensing and cancellations, having an online so the partners or customers can do that themselves. And like mentioned earlier, an online billing is, is required, probably. Um, and operations, it's, it's no critical to remember that you are now running the applications for the customers, not the customers themselves. So if you have a bug in your application and it crashes in a customer's data center, it affects that customer. But if you have a bug in your software as a service solution and it goes down, it affects all your customers. And that can mean the end of your business if it's, it's really bad. So you do have to add, add more, uh, more into testing and, and testing. And when you're running the application, you have uh, ongoing operation costs for, for uh, the servers and also for the staff that manage this. So it's, it's need to be put into the, the, the metrics of how you price this offer. So this also, also affects software development. Uh, in a software as a service solution, applications are typically updated quite often. And, and, and releasing a new version every year is, or two isn't acceptable. You, typically, there's uh, like um, de deployment every month, or even more often. If you see companies like Facebook, they are, they are changing it all the time. But this is also a, a risk for the customer because they, from one day to another, can get new features they, are, they didn't ask for, or, or old one goes away. So it's, it's also you have to be aware here that you don't change it too much to, to scare the customer. Yeah. And it also changes the deployment and development process because when, when deploying to, <laughs> to a shared solution, you have to be really careful so you don't, you don't have uh, downtime or, or affects the customers badly when doing upgrades. So this all affects your organization also. You, you have three choices here actually to do, how to do when you start software as a service. You could do 
it inside your current f uh, firm structure and if you're a small company that's probably the best way to do that uh, the risk is that the sales force and and the manage and, and the marketing might not work well together with the old old model so if if sales uh, force are are in incentive better in an on-premise solution and uh, in an uh, software so service solution they will sell the on-premise solution and we had examples of people building building a software so service solution and, and they complained that nobody is buying that and the reason was that the sellers didn't sell it <laughs> so you have to be, be yeah. carefully aware of that <laughs> it's an important choice yeah. yeah so and it could create a new software as a service group within your company that focuses only on this new application and and the sales process around it the risk is that it it creates a tension between this this new group with the new cool stuff and and the old group. Uh, this is risks that you always have when, you, when new things or changes are in organizations. So this is probably, I wouldn't say easy, but it's, it's manage manageable to, to manage these kinds of tensions. And if it's, if it's uh, big enough, the, the, the software so solution offering, the new one, you should uh, evaluate if it's, you should spin off a new company uh, that focuses on this. Uh, there are several risks attached to this, so you should really, really be careful of before doing this because it's, it's, it's replicates your, your uh, company in another company and adds management uh, and adds costs that might be too much. And, and these models could also change, for example, from doing the inside your company to a spin-off over time if that feels more correct over time. So, before some going to cloud computing, I would summarize that even even if you're if you're if you're a software company that today are focusing on on-premise solutions, you really should evaluate if software as a service is something for you. I believe that you you're not going to get away from this without evaluating this this really really carefully yeah and and, and the thing is that uh, you can also uh, uh, concerning Azure um, applications you can contact me and and uh, here in Finland so same contact information that we we gave you with Windows 8 Windows phone so with also with Azure you can contact me and uh, we can look together what would be good options for you yeah uh, and if you need that uh, if you want to do a more one-to-one -one decision business decision de discussion and go into more details about this uh, I'm also through Tara yeah. to, to book me and I can, we can do a discussion about that yes yes so I'm, I'm working, we didn't tell you, but I'm working closely with Ronnie. So Ronnie will be here in Finland uh, yeah. every few weeks, after every few weeks. So yeah. 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 So And even if they're not here, we are able to do some <laughs> yeah. on, on link or yeah. something like that. Yeah. So that was all about software as a service, about your application. I'm now going over to the next transformation, the cloud computing part. So instead of hosting your software so solution on on premise or or uh, on other hoster, small hoster, I'm going to talk about cloud computing. And cloud computing is all about uh, the four tenants in cloud computing defined by uh, and the American Com uh, National Institute of Software Technology and NYIST, and it defines that cloud computing need to have all of those four uh, characteristics. And you have to have pooled resources. That means you have to have network, uh, so CPU, and storage. You have to have self-service that the customers have to be able to go uh, to go to a site, purchase what they need online, and they don't have to go to the hosting company and uh, negotiate a deal that's that's locking them in for uh, one year, two year, or three years. This is a self-service. You you go on site and you buy it. It's elastic, meaning you can you can scale up or down on what you need and it's usage ba usage based meaning that you pay for what you use not what you uh, um, agree upfront on uh, 
uh, which can be an offer, of course, of course in, in, uh, in this cloud computing. The most vendors, of, uh, including Azure, will give you a, a discount if you, if you go up front uh, with payment. This gives you, when you have cloud computing, this gives you three important things. In the economics, it gives you, there's no large investments up front. You don't have to invest in, in hardware and infrastructure, cooling and power to get your data center up and running. Um, it gives you agility, meaning you, you will get quicker to market with your application. But, not, but it's not about features and functionality, it's about, also about what happens if your, if your website is so, uh, somebody in the marketing are running a big commercials and everybody is seeing this and they are going to your site to read about it and it's, it's, uh, your website is, is underwater with, uh, with traffic. It's, it's really quick in, in this way to just scale up and have, have more power to serve the, the users. This also goes from, from marketing to, to your uh, software as a service offer where you can scale this on, on demand as your users, user space grow. And this allows you to focus on, on your app, your data. You don't have to think about too much about internal plumbing, about uh, infrastructure and the, uh, and the hosting. So now we're going to dip, dive into Windows Azure, some of the platform essentials. I'm not going to do a deep dive here because there's no time for it. And if you want that, we can, <laughs> we can arrange it either through yeah. uh, Tarja or, or uh, me or Johanny here yes. can help with that. So it's... Um, So Windows Azure are globally available in, in three regions, uh, US, Europe, and Asia. We have, at the moment, we have eight uh, large data centers, and we have a lot, 20 plus uh, caching nodes uh, around the globe. Um, this is an overview of the Azure platform. And on the top, we see the frameworks that we currently support for, uh, for running your code on Azure. Even if, it's, if, it's, uh, if your language is not listed here, whatever language that might be, uh, all the APIs on Azure are REST-based. So if you don't have an SDK, you, you can do all this programming doing uh, REST interfaces. And you could, since the, the frameworks are open source from Microsoft, you could even take the, one of those frameworks and port it to your, to your language and you will have support, support for it. Microsoft is also uh, also uh, adding more and more frameworks into our stack, and and I will guess that we will have more to announce during next week about that. So people that have of, often thinking that we only Azure is for is for .NET, but we love all of the other ones: Java, PHP, and Node, uh, and Python. So there is no. And even if you have old COM applications on, and binary apps, they will also run. It's, this is Windows Server, so if it, if it runs on a Windows Server, it will run in, in Azure. Uh, you will probably need something to do some bit architecture to get it running uh, for, to front the interface for the users, but the back end will run. A part of, uh, on level two in this diagram, we have services, and it's, uh, it's in, a, in addition to the to the, to the fabric where, where we actually run stuff, we have a lot of services for, for, for you to use in your application and we are adding more and more f uh, things to the service layer all, all the time. So, so typically there are, we have caching for getting better performance in your application, we have uh, identity, so you could uh, log on to your applications using, uh, uh, using Active Directory or Google or Facebook. We have service bus for interconnectivity between your apps and, and, uh, and on-premise solutions. We have media, media services for uh, enabling on-demand on playback and, and real-time uh, streaming. We have CDNs, which are caching of static data or videos. And if you don't like ours, we, are, uh, we support uh, like, like Akamai or other CDNs connected to the, your solution if that's, that's a thing. We have big data and support, meaning we have Hadoop support in our solution. We have commerce with uh, 
Azure Marketplace. Uh, we have integration services using the bus. We have some uh, reporting and analytics. We have uh, HPC or high performance computing support. And we have also just announced uh, Windows Azure mobile backend. So with your Windows 8 applications, yeah. I guess you'll be discuss discussing this. Yeah, well, we, uh, yeah, a little bit, but uh, just Russ and told that uh, you should also think about uh, the backend when you are building uh, Windows 8 and, and uh, Windows Phone Azure. Uh, Windows Phone application, so yeah. Yeah, so we but, we, about it, but yeah. if you're building a real software service solution, you will probably build your backend yeah. yourself. So you will then we will stay away from the mobile uh, service. But if you're only building us like a Windows Phone or Windows 8 uh, application, you, you could get away with the, the mobile uh, mobile services. Yeah, yeah. So on, on the fabric layer, we have support for for virtual machines. That's like. Uh, same as running it in our own data center, but the exception is that we are running it for you. We have uh, websites which, which, which was new this summer, which are, are quick and easy ways to get up and running uh, for a small number of money. Um, um, applications like Jomla, or, uh, or we have a library where you can choose your op lots of open source. Uh, applications and run them as a website and you can also deploy your apps there. This is a shared environment so it's uh, the performance is not that good but for, for your customer customers facing website if for a small company this is a perfect solution and it's easy to move away from from a shared solution to a, to your own scaled cloud services by, by changing the set configurations. And then we have the cloud services which are our platform as a service offering. Also a part of the fabric is uh, the storage part and the networking part. And in storage we have the SQL database, which is a special version of SQL, uh, SQL which runs in Azure. And we, you should, uh, to, there are some differences between those, those two versions. And we have a SQL Azure migration wizard, which can help you evaluate the changes you need to do on your database before you can move them. And we also have a, a NoSQL database offering called TableStore, which is, um, scales massively. So depending on, on the needs for joins and uh, complex queries, you should evaluate uh, using, using the NoSQL version. Or if you have a um, really high traffic website, you should evaluate using both where, and using a CQRS pattern where you store your master data into SQL and you have your, your read-only part in, in NoSQL to get really, really quick access for all the reads. And then we have blob storage, which, which can com be compared to your file server. It's, it's, it stores binary files. And it's also, it can be accessed from your, from your internal machines, but it can also be available directly on the internet. So, for example, if you're delivering images on your, from your CMS system or something. You don't have to go through the virtual machines or the cloud services. You could, in your HTML code, just point directly to your blob storage and, and serve your images directly from there. We also have a networking stack where we have uh, VPNs uh, functionality for connecting your, your cloud service to your on-premise solution. And we have a traffic manager that enables uh, load balancing between uh, different data centers. For example, uh, if you're in the United States, you, the traffic could be directed to a data center in the States, and when you move to Europe, uh, the same URL will redirect your traffic to a data center in Europe. And it can also be used for failover if one data center goes out. It could either be a, someone, typically a, someone uh, doing uh, the, f the fiber is, uh, is destroyed by some uh, um, something that's happened outside the data center. It doesn't mean that the data center is offline. It could be just communication to the data center that is, 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 is dead. So I'm going to go in some details about the, on the fabric on the compute side. And let's see. Yeah, so the compute and the application building blocks which we've been through. Now, 
where the compute is, is virtual machines, websites, or cloud services, together with the application building blocks. will be the infrastructure for your app. So there are three ways to getting started using Windows Azure for, for serving your content. There are cloud services. This is the platform as a service offering from Microsoft. Um, we have the virtual machi machines and we have the websites. So the Windows Azure cloud services are stateless virtual machines. Which this is different from, from, uh, from virtual machines in that uh, whatever you store on your C drive will, be a, will probably be lost after a reboot. Or for example, if, we, if uh, a server crashes, we will spin up a new one for you, but it will probably be on another physical server. And so if your content is not stored in storage, meaning SQL or blobs, uh, the content will be lost. Uh, so we have two flavors of the cloud uh, services. This is a web role and a worker role. This is it's simply two versions of, of Windows Server, one with IIS and one without. So on the web role, you can run your ASP.NET applications. And in the worker role, you typically run your background processing stuff. You can, if you want, do a worker role and install Apache or whatever else, other ones, or run Node, so you can, that's listening for port 80. You don't have to uh, be afraid of serving TCP connections to your web role, or to your worker role, sorry. Uh, and they the web role and the worker role are, when you deploy your solution, they are connected so you can send messages through them together. The difference between uh, a cloud service and a typical on-premise uh, or virtual machine is that you don't remote desktop into the application, and, uh, into the server and install your application and configure it. You, you have to build a package and you typically use Visual Studio to do that and we also have a plugin for Eclipse, uh, but you have to big build a package that's, that's in fact your setup script that brings in all your DLLs and, and, and uh, content into a, a, a zip file actually. And, and that one is st stored in storage and when you boot up your web role and worker roles, they will uh, get this um, setup script and run it and make, your, make it available. So, so when you have built your, your uh, package, it's easy to scale from one server to 100 servers if needed because you have already done the job to build the package. And using Visual Studio, it's, 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 it's kind of easy to do that. It's not com complex. If you have been using a uh, Vice or Install Shield to build setup scripts, this is, this is going to be <laughs> a positive experience. <laughs> um, for Windows Azure, yeah, and one, one more important thing is that when you run it in a cloud service, this is a platform as a service offering and, and you have to think about your app. Microsoft is running your the Windows operating systems and it also patches the operating system and the .NET runtime. So a good example for that was that uh, in, uh, in December last year, they discovered a bug in the HTTP stack on all web servers, including IIS and Apache. And, and just a couple of days after this was, uh, the fix was out, all the servers in Windows Azure were patched. And this was during the whole days. So if you had this running in an infrastructure service or on-premise, you probably had to get uh, away from a Christmas party and go to the office, install the patch, reboot the servers and, and go home. Yeah. So it's, so it's <laughs> not very nice <laughs> thing, <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and this is also critical because the servers yeah. uh, they would die if you if you sent them the uh, the wrong or the, the correct message. Yeah, that's uh, a good point. Yeah. yeah. So script kiddies could have a really Christmas holiday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. So when we go into infrastructure as a service, you 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 manage uh, those machines through either through the management portal of of Azure 
or to scripts. We support both Windows uh, scripting with PowerShell and Linux and Mac to uh, bash scripts. But in the end it all goes to a REST API in Windows Azure. And, and so if you don't want those scripts you can actually build your own uh, management stuff. And you, when you're going to the portal, you can select images and, and the virtual machine size. And at the moment, we support uh, Windows Server 2008, and it says Windows 8, but that's uh, Windows 2012 Server. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a new name. And we support uh, three versions of Linux uh, there to, to choose from. And actually, you store a VHD file, which is the Hyper-V uh, image in, in blob storage, and your, your server boots from this storage, from this image. So, but these machines you have to manage, you have to install them, you have to configure them, and you have to patch them. It's, it's your, but this is an easy way to get your applications moved to the cloud. You don't have to do any infrastructure or architectural changes to do that. It just moves it and it runs. Yeah. So it, this is going to be a great path for moving part of your applications directly to the cloud and then adding platform as a service for, for example, for reporting or, or other stuff that you want to scale or run, uh, let Microsoft ha handle the operat operation of. Um, I see we're getting a lot of, out of time here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm quickly going to walk through some key scenarios uh, for, uh, for Azure Virtual Machine and cloud services. And I think we're going to stop there after that. Yeah. Um, so for Windows Azure virtual machines, the typical is migrate existing applications. Uh, like I mentioned, it's, it's just moving them over and it will run. We are supporting a SQL Server directly in, the, in, in that. And we also, for example, if you have SharePoint or, or even uh, BizTalk, you can run that in, in, in the virtual machine. You could have your development and your test environment running in the virtual machine. And if you're an enterprise, you could have, or even a small company, you could have a backup of your if you're running Hyper-V, of course, in your local data center, you could back up your, your VHD files to, to Azure. And if something awful happens, you could run, you can start your servers quickly in, in the disaster recovery scenario in, in Azure. And you can have a hybrid version where you extend part of your local infrastructure to, to cloud. For example, if you need one month you do some processing or something just for a month, you need more computers, you can create those computers in, in Azure, connect them to your local network using VPN, and, and have them available. It, it doesn't need to, to be internet-facing uh, applications. It can be only internals. For Windows Azure Cloud Services, typically I will send all new, new applications. You have to design them for platform as a service. It's, it's the only correct way <laughs> to do it and because of the benefits of doing the platform for scaling, for, for ease, of, ease of operations and, and stuff like that. And you can do the hybrid solution where you have part of your application doing platform as a service and part of your application as either on-premise or, or infrastructure. So. I would be happy to talk more about this and, and get back to you. So I see time is running out here. Yep. So <laughs> <laughs> you're going to stop here and, and get in touch with me. Uh, can I move to the last slide here? Yeah, you can actually, uh, we can show that in the end. I yeah. will talk. Hey, uh, kiitos kaikille tästä Teknet TV lähetyksestä ja, ja tota, toivottavasti teille tämä oli myöskin antoisa lähetys. Eli Eli tota, tosiaan Ronniin saa yhteyttä ronni.hansenat.microsoft.com ja myöskin minun kautta voi sitten, että jos teillä tulee jotain kysymyksiä ää, Windows 8, Windows Phone tai Azure-sovelluksiin liittyen, niin, niin minun voi ottaa yhteyttä. Mutta kiitoksia paljon. Thank you, Ronni, to visit here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye bye.